Well, today we're going to be talking about Blaise Pascal and an approach to thinking about religious questions that's very different from either the empiricist approaches we looked at in Aquinas and other philosophers, or the other a priori approaches taken by rationalists, such as Augustine or Anselm or Descartes. Pascal starts with the premise that we cannot really understand God. That is to say that God is something that lies beyond our powers of comprehension. Now, if you don't believe in God, you might think, well, there's nothing much to understand. If you do, you might think, look, God is so great that human capacities, human concepts, are really inadequate to understanding what God is. So where Augustine says, God is the most excellent thing there is, and Anselm says, essentially, God is that the greater than which cannot be seen, the most excellent thing there could possibly be. Pascal says, I don't have any idea how to define God. God, if God exists, is really indefinable. And that creates a problem. Moreover, he says, lots of people think there's evidence for or against the existence of God, but Pascal doubts that. After all, you might say, but wait a minute, I have the scriptures. They reveal these truths to me. And he admits, look, there are other scriptures that reveal different things about different gods. Um, you might raise questions about all of those. How good is any of that evidence? And look at the arguments that Aquinas offers, for example, about the design in the universe, or a series of causes that couldn't go back to infinity. And he says, I don't know if any of those are really very powerful or not. So he tries to find a foundation for faith that is independent of all those arguments, independent of actual historical circumstances and evaluation of the adequacy or inadequacy of scriptures of various kinds. He says, maybe we can think about this differently. So here is his vision of the human condition. Let's imagine a number of men in chains, and all condemned to death, where some are killed each day in sight of the others. And those who remain see their own fate and that of their fellows and wait their turn, <coughs> looking at each other sorrowfully and without hope. It's a pretty bleak picture, right? Imagine you're just there with a bunch of other people. You're all condemned to death. Some are killed in front of you every day, and you're just waiting your turn to die. Well, he says, it's an image of a condition of men. That is your situation, people. Right. Oh, okay, that's really bleak. But now, he thinks some important things follow from that. If that's the situation we're in, we really are in a circumstance where we're condemned to death, where some of us die each day in the view of others, where we're essentially just waiting our turn. What does it mean about human life? What does it mean about the nature of the universe, about the possible meaning of our lives. He says, well, by faith we know his existence. In glory we shall know his nature. Now, that's a bleak picture, but he says, there's nothing about analyzing that picture that's going to lead you to the existence of a god. In fact, it's a pretty awful picture if you think about it. Nevertheless, it's possible to know his existence, not on the basis of an argument not on the basis of considering experience, not on the basis of a priori considerations, contemplating the concept of God or anything like that. No, instead by faith. And eventually, he says, after death, we will know God's glory. But of course, <laughs> for now, that, we can't really sort of evaluate that because the people who experience that can't communicate it back. So, here is his word. He says, look, if there is a God, he is infinitely incomprehensible. That is to say, the gap between us and God is so great that if God exists, there is no way for us to actually understand or define God. There's no way to grasp God's nature. If we're put in a situation with Socrates, where Socrates says, oh, you believe, or, or for that matter, don't believe in God, well, tell me then, you must have some idea of what God is. What is God? <laughs> um, Pascal's point is no one would be able to answer that question adequately. Question in the back. OK, bear with me here. Okay. I'm um, so if that were true, like, how would we even have the concept of God if, like, if we were not knowing him at all? Like, how, would we, how would that be something that would have ever came into our thoughts? Does that make sense? Sure, okay. Can we have concepts that really are incomprehensible to us, that are infinitely incomprehensible, that we can't define? Um, yeah, let's think about that. And let's think about what he might mean by infinite incomprehensibility. Notice he goes on to say, since having neither parts nor limits, he has no affinity to us. This is a tricky matter in two ways. So let's start with some examples. Are there concepts you think you have 
where you could not give a definition of what that thing is. <laughs> Lots of concepts we have we think we could define. I have the concept of a triangle, and I think I could define it. Oh, a plane figure with three straight lines, three angles. Um, but there are lots of other things, maybe, that I can't define. Examples. Yeah? Like the smell. Oh, like a color. Define red. How would you do that? Or define a smell. Like, think of the smell of a hard-boiled egg. You peel the um, shell, <laughs> and you sniff the hard-boiled egg. Okay? It has a very distinctive smell. And if you've ever eaten a hard-boiled egg, you know what I'm talking about. But it's like, how would you define that? Let's say somebody has no sense of smell at all, and you're trying to describe to them the smell of a hard-boiled egg. Could you give them a definition? I mean, I couldn't do it. Uh, what are some other examples? Yeah? The concept of infinity. Ooh, the concept of infinity. Is the concept of infinity something that you could give a definition for? Kind of, like you can give like a literal definition of it, but you can't like really comprehend it. Like since like we're such limited <laughs> things, like you can't comprehend like. So. Ooh, all right, good. Infinity is an interesting example because you might think there are several different gradations here, and infinity might be an example of something that points out actually definability is only one component. After all, I, I don't know, maybe you can't give a definition of infinity. I can give a definition of infinity. In fact, John Newton could give a uh, definition of infinity. The very last verse, or in some versions, the next to last verse, of Amazing Grace um, says, when we've been there 10,000 years, like shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we'd first begun. And that last, those last two lines are basically a definition of infinity. An infinite set is one that can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself. Okay, so you've been there 10,000 years and you still have no fewer days. <laughs> uh, so think about the number of natural numbers, for example, zero, one, two, three, and then the number of even numbers, zero, two, four, six, etc. You can put those two sets in one-to-one -one correspondence, match zero with zero, one with two, <laughs> two with four, etc., etc., and that indicates that that's an infinite set. So actually, Mathematicians can give you a definition of what an infinite set is, but nevertheless you feel as if, but I don't really grasp the, the idea of infinity. And it gets worse when you study higher degrees of infinity. For example, consider the set of subsets of the natural numbers. That has a cardinality that's higher than the set of natural numbers. And so the real, there are more real numbers than there are natural numbers, for example. You can't put them into one-to-one -one correspondence. And then you can think about the set of functions on the reals, and that takes you up to a higher degree of infinity, and so on and so forth. And there are lots of cool hypotheses about that. So if you want to study set theory at some point in the future, I'll tell you it's an absolutely awesome field where a lot of exciting work remains to be done. But nevertheless, even if you've done, as I have, if you've taken graduate courses on set theory and all of this, you still feel in the end infinity is something you don't quite grasp. Even though you can give a definition, even though you can prove a bunch of theorems about it, you still somehow feel as if there's something that goes beyond your full understanding. And so you might think, well, there are a number of things. I have some idea of what the smell of a hard-boiled egg is, but I can't define it. I can define infinity, but still I feel as if something about it eludes my grasp. And so there are lots of things we could mean in saying that the concept of God is incomprehensible. Now, it is true that one sort of incomprehensibility means you have no concept at all. For example, let's say you hear an economist talking and that person mentions heteroscedasticity. You think, what's that? <laughs> okay, and you just have no concept at all that goes with that. That is incomprehensible. That talk will be incomprehensible because you don't know what the basic term is. Presumably somebody knows what it means, but it might not be you. And so, if it's like that, if the concept of God is one where just nobody has any idea what they're talking about, then we'd say, yeah, that's really utter incomprehensibility. Um, if you want an example of that, think about some of the poetry of Lewis Carroll, the Jabberwocky, you know, where the terms seem kind of meaningless, or Finnegan's Way, the Joyce writes, where parts of it just seem to be involved, made, made up language and so forth. So all of those things could point us to different things he might mean here. But at least there's a possibility of having a concept that is, well, doesn't give us any comprehension, and yet is enough to let us use the word 
For example, if somebody says, hey, look, it's God, and they're pointing at my Apple Watch, I'll say, you know, no, that's definitely not God. It might be that I can't tell you a lot about what God is, but I can tell you this isn't God, right? Or earlier today, sadly, I went to a Mewtwo raid, and the guy right behind the first ball caught a perfect Mewtwo. And I think, I didn't get him. Eight straight greater excellent curveballs. Still. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but if somebody said, oh, you at least got to encounter God. The Mewtwo is God. <laughs> I'm saying, no, no, sorry. God is not a creation of Niantic Corporation and the Pokemon group and so on. And so there are things we can say, even about a concept, we can't really say much positive about. For example, if you go to this economist talk, and the economist is talking about heteroscedasticity, and you say, oh, yeah, that's my cat. <laughs> and this isn't a joke about having named your cat heteroscedasticity, but you actually think that that refers to cats. Then, no, you know, no, we can say, I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's not about cats. So, let's continue looking at this. He has no affinity to us. This is the other element of this that I wanted to bring out. Aquinas had the view that the terms we use cannot be literally applied to God. That is to say, God's power infinitely transcends our power. That God's goodness infinitely transcends our own goodness. That God's knowledge transcends our knowledge infinitely. But nevertheless, Aquinas says, it's possible for us to talk about God because there's an analogy between God's power and our power, God's goodness and our goodness. This is called the doctrine of analogical predication. There's an analogy between them, even if it's not quite the same thing. Does the cat know anything? Well, you might argue, yes, cats have knowledge, but not in exactly the same sense that we do, in a sense analogous to that. And that's the kind of thing that he has in mind, but a much greater gap between us and God. So when we say God is good, or God is powerful, or God has great knowledge, or even God is omniscient, omnipotent, etc., those are things that have content, it's just that they can't grasp God fully and adequately. They point us in some way, there's an analogy. It's as if we were talking about the smell of a boiled egg, and we said, well, it's kind of like, actually, kind of like what? Could you give an analogy? Could you give a... Somebody's never had an egg before, <laughs> and you're trying to describe the smell of a boiled egg. Could you... Well, yeah, it's kind of like sulfur. It's kind of like grandma's house. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know, there's some sort of analogy that you come up with for it. <laughs> yeah, my grandmother lived on a hill over a steel mill, so that's why the grandma's house smells like sulfur. <laughs> anyway, um, that you might say, look, as a result of this, we could know God, but only through analogy, only in this kind of indirect way. Well, that's what Aquinas says. Here, Pascal is going further. He's saying, no, we can't even draw the analogy. We're really incapable of knowing either what he is, or even, he says, if he is. We cannot not have knowledge of the existence or the non-existence of God. Pascal says, really, in the end, it comes down to faith. It's not a matter of knowledge. Nobody can give you the justification. Nobody can give you a real solid argument, either in favor of or against God's existence. So, he says, look, don't blame Christians for not being able to give a reason for their belief. Nobody can give a reason for their belief. And it's not just a positive thing. If somebody doesn't believe, nobody can really give you a solid reason why they don't believe. It's not that kind of thing, okay? Uh, but at least Christians admit it. He says they profess a religion for which they can't give a reason. They declare that it's foolishness, stultitiam in the Latin. And then you complain that they don't prove it. If they proved it, they wouldn't keep their word. And so he's basically saying, yes, Christianity really does admit. Paul in 1 Corinthians admits he can't give you an argument for this. It comes down to faith. And Pascal is saying really every religious person, and in fact every person with respect to religious questions, is in just the same place. You believe or you don't believe, there is no way to have a rational justification for either stance. You can't disprove God's existence, but you can't prove it either. And so he says all those arguments that philosophers have, have advanced, do they really convince anybody? Um, you know, who? Re reads the ontological argument and says, oh, that's it. Of course, that the greater than which cannot be conceived has to exist. Yes, I fall to my knees and I believe. <laughs> okay, probably nobody has ever encountered that argument and said, that's my reason for believing. 
or thinks about Aquinas' argument for the first cause. Ah, things are arranged in causal series. Could it go back infinitely far? Uh, no, there had to be a first cause. Everybody calls that God. Yes, I'm convinced. His point is, no, those arguments, maybe they have some force, but they're not conclusive. And similarly, on the other side, the problem of evil. How could a good and all-powerful and all-knowing God exist if there's evil? Well, that's maybe some reason not to believe, but it's not very conclusive. People have proposed all sorts of ways of reconciling them. So, he says, really, referring to this passage, by the way, I won't go through all that, but that's there in case you wonder what his reference is, where he talks about uh, Jews demand signs, the Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. Now, here is Pascal's way of addressing the problem. Suppose we don't really have any solid concept of God that gives us any degree of comprehension. We can't define God, we can't grasp God's nature, we can't really fill in anything very positive about God's character. But also assume that there are no conclusive arguments on either side. In fact, no really very good arguments on either side in favor of or against God's existence. What do we do? He says, well, God is or he's not. But to which side shall we incline? Reason can decide nothing here. There's an infinite chaos that separated us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn up. What will you wager? According to reason, you can do neither the one thing nor the other. According to reason, you can defend neither of the propositions. So, suppose I say, yes, I'm going to put something in one of my hands. Now, actually, that's too big. <laughs> I can't hide that. <laughs> Let me try something else. Okay, here, how about this? Yes. I'm shuffling it from one hand to the other. And now, okay, which hand is it in? Right. Now you're right. <laughs> okay, bad example. <laughs> I, I would make a terrible magician. I mean, I, I'm not good at distraction. Uh, but okay, yes, uh, well, bad example. But suppose, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> suppose I did a better job of that, <laughs> and you had no idea which to choose. You might say, look, reason can decide nothing here. I don't know. Or if somebody's playing one of those little three you know, shell games where they're moving it around, and you don't even see what, how to start. You just come into the game partly through. And so it's now, which of the three is the little P under? You think, well, I have no information at all. And that's the position we're in with respect to God's existence. But with respect to that P, you might say, well, who cares, right? And nothing really depends on it. But suppose somebody walks up to you as you're looking at that and says, OK, guess which one it's under. If you guess correctly, you get a million dollars. If you guess incorrectly, I will shoot you. <laughs> All of a sudden, now a lot depends on it, right? And yet you have no information. You have no argument that it's on this, in, under this little cup or under that little cup. So what do you do? That, he says, is the position we're in. We don't have any conclusive arguments, even very good arguments at all, in favor of God's existence or against God's existence. But he says it matters a lot. Your eternal soul, your eternal fate, depends on what you choose. So it's very much like that little game where a lot depends on something and you have no relevant information. You have no basis on which to decide one thing as opposed to another. So is it just arbitrary? You just guess? In that situation I've described, you might just guess. You say, well, I don't know which of the three it is. So, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, or, you know, you just look away and turn around and pick the one first one. Whatever you do to randomize this, you are really just doing something that is arbitrary. So is that the position we're in? Well, actually, Pascal has an argument that we can do better than that. Ian Hacking describes this as the first well-understood contribution to decision theory. And really, what Pascal is doing here is starting the entire field of decision theory, of game theory. Uh, it's quite a sophisticated little argument he gives. And philosophers still debate the adequacy or inadequacy of this argument. It's about deciding under conditions of uncertainty. Now, often we're sort of uncertain. We're not sure what's going on or what will happen if we do this or do that. Here, we've got a situation of pretty total uncertainty, where we have no idea um, what to do. So what should we do? How should we think about such situations? Well, here's the way Pascal puts it. Does God exist? It's a question that you have to decide, and a lot hangs on the answer. So place your bet. 
And there's total uncertainty. There's really no data. There is no argument you can rely on, no evidence you can really rely on. Um, you are stuck in a position of having no information and having to place a bet. So what should you do? Now, in a lot of situations, the only thing that would make sense is to pick randomly, um, as in that situation I described. Um, or in Las Vegas, let's say, there's a game and it happens that it's just 50% one way, 50% the other. Which should you choose? Somebody saying, you know, gosh, I'm going to play this roulette, uh, it's red or black. Should I play red or should I play black? black? Just pick one, right? There's no rational reason for doing one or the other. But with the existence of God, he says, it's different. Let's weigh the gain and the loss in wagering that God is. Let us estimate these two chances. If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager, then without hesitation, that he is. So let's think about that a moment <laughs> further. He's, notice this is not an argument in favor of the existence of God. This is in favor of placing your bet in a certain way. Okay? This is in favor of having faith. But it's not an argument that God exists. It's rather an argument that if you've got to place a bet under total uncertainty, this is the bet you ought to place. Yeah? But this is, I think this is really simplistic because you're not really betting between two options. You're betting between a whole lot of different religions. And if you lose one, you don't lose nothing. You might have lost <laughs> picking one god and you to some other god's hell. Oh, okay, there are a lot of objections that have been raised against this, and you're pointing to one. Actually, earlier in the semester, I showed you a Simpson clip where um, Bart gives this argument, as a matter of fact, and says, uh, or actually, no, I'm sorry, it's Homer who gives this, and Bart's just approvingly swaying at the breakfast table. But yes, Homer's decided not to go to church anymore, and Homer says, look, what if we pick the wrong, wrong religion? Then every Sunday morning, we're making God matter and matter. <laughs> uh, and so, you're right, this is a... A very simplified situation where we just have these two options, that yes or no, that God exists or that God doesn't exist, and you're right. Anyway, we'll come to that objection more in a moment, but you might be wait, it's much more complicated than this. Um, but here is how he's thinking of it, okay? Saying a bet on God can't lose. Either there's a God, that's that leftmost column, or there's no God, okay? That's the right column. And you can't really control that, we don't know anything about it. But suppose you believe, well then if God exists, you get rewarded with heaven, okay? Eternal bliss. Suppose there is no God, well at least you lead a virtuous life. You get virtue out of the deal at any rate, so actually you lead a better life than you might have led otherwise. In either case, you benefit. What if you don't believe? Well, if there is a God, you're in big trouble, okay? Eternal damnation. But then, what if there is no God and you don't believe? <laughs> well, you're right, but you have, you're not going to be around to know it. <laughs> Just poof, okay? Nothing. So, Pascal is basically saying, wait a minute, a bet in favor of God can't lose. Either I get heaven or I at least get a virtuous life, but if I bet against God, I can't win. Either I go to hell, or it turns out after my death I just don't exist at all. And so he's saying, either way, I'm better off believing. Suppose God exists, then I'm better off believing. I get heaven as opposed to hell. Suppose there is no God, I'm still better off because I get virtue instead of, well, whatever life I would have led otherwise. And I certainly get no benefit from having been correct. Now, this is an argument that, well, we can analyze a little bit more carefully. There's the idea, heaven's better than hell, and virtue's better than nothing. So in either case, whether God exists or not, I'm better off Believe it. Now, there's a name for that in decision theory and game theory. That's called a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is one which makes me better off no matter what the other player is doing. And in this case, the player is just nature. If there is, it either is a god or is not. And so, there's, oh, yes, belief turns out to be a dominant strategy. I am better off believing no matter what else goes on, if, whether god exists or not. Either way, I'm better off believing. So goes the argument. And here's how he expresses it. You will be faithful, humble, grateful, generous, a sincere friend, truthful. But certainly you will not have those poisonous pleasures, glory, and luxury. But won't you have others? I will tell you that you will thereby gain in this life. And that at each step you take on this road, you'll see so great a certainty of gain, so much nothingness in what you risk, 
The LLS recognize you've wagered for something certain and infinite, for which you have given nothing. So that's his idea. Look, even if God doesn't exist, you will end up better off. Now, we've already looked at one objection to this, which is, wait a minute, I've got more strategies than just believing or not believing. In fact, if you think about it, this is a very Protestant way of looking at things. It's a matter of just of faith, right? And the only thing that really matters is faith in God, and so it's actually not even quite Protestant, because it doesn't here have to be the Christian God. Uh, and now you might think, wait, one complication. Aren't there more choices than this? After all, maybe I'm a believing Christian, or maybe I'm a believing Jew, or a believing Muslim, or a believing Hindu, or I am a Buddhist, or I am a, you know, etc. fill in the blank, keep going. There are many, many options. And even within Christianity, you might say, look, does it matter whether I'm a Catholic, or Eastern Orthodox, or a Lutheran, or a Presbyterian, or an Episcopalian, or Church of Christ, or blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, you might say, look, even within Christianity, I have like 500 choices. And so, does it make a difference? Now, you might think, no, it doesn't really make a difference, but you might think it does. I have Catholic friends who think it, think it makes a very big difference. Um, and so, in short, you could look at this and you could say, no, all right, first of all, <laughs> there's that. Now, second thing is, suppose there's another dimension of complication. After all, it's not just, do you believe in this Christian version, this religion, or that religion, but also there's the question of, well, what do you mean, believe in it? Right? Um, what do you do about it? One person might say it's enough to just believe. Yes, I believe. But I don't really do much about it. <laughs> another person goes to church every Sunday, let's say. Yet another person, you know, doesn't just go to church every Sunday, but sings in the choir and serves on the board and blah, 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 and spends weekends helping the poor, etc. And so you might think, well, there are lots and lots of other choices. <coughs> So anyway, one objection is that there need to be a lot more rows in this table for one reason or another. Maybe there are different ways of worshiping, different reasons for believing, different ways of acting that go along with belief. Maybe there are de many different religions. And shouldn't those go in? What if the religion you choose just makes God matter and matter? As Homer worries, then it's not so simple. Um, are there other objections you might raise against this? Yeah. Oh, that's another reason you might object to this. You might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're believing only because of your own self-interest. That is to say, you're facing this and saying, well, I don't know anything about this God stuff, but, but you know, if I cast my lot with the atheists, I got nothing to gain. And if I go to church on Sunday, hey, maybe I win. <laughs> and, you know, at worst, those people seem nice. You know, I'll hear some good music. Get to see Bonifac play bass guitar. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so, you, yeah, it, but yes, it would look like, wait, this is entirely self-interested. Is that a good reason? Now, some religious people like Pascal have said, hey, I don't care why you believe. You know, it's good enough for me. Uh, but others have said, that's not the kind of reason that you can have and really have the proper sort of faith. Uh, I'm believing just because I think, you know, I'll be better off in the end if I do. That's, uh, some pe people, anyway, have found that something that's really incompatible with true religious faith. Uh, yeah? Um, I have met quite a few people who do believe in God that are very far from virtuous and vice versa, and people that don't believe in God are like the kindest people you ever be. So this, this, mm. the squares aren't exactly true. Okay, good, good. Is it true that you get virtue but lose nothing if you actually are a believer? Um, there might be lots of believers who are not very virtuous. Of course, we don't know what they would have been like if they didn't believe. They'd be even worse people. <laughs> but it might make you worry, right? It might be that religion makes some people better people, and maybe it makes some other people worse people. So there's that worry. Also, there are plenty of virtuous people who aren't believers, and so you might think, wait a minute, what if actually uh, those people, if they became believers, would actually lose some of that virtue, or anyway, they wouldn't gain anything, right? And so what he needs here, in a sense, you don't have to necessarily be better off, but you surely have to be no worse off. And so let's think about that question. Are there any things you might lose by believing and living a life of faith? He seems like, look, you're not losing anything. Oh, except maybe, you know, too much concern for material things or fame or glory, but it's not worth anything anyway. But is there anything you could lose? Yeah. 
I guess like certain life like, experience that other people that aren't like as uh, like some people that don't or that do sin get like certain kind of life experience that other people don't. Oh, okay, good. Suppose you're doing this virtuous life. Are there really no cost to that? People, I mean, why do people sin or commit immoral acts? You might think, well, because they gain something from it, right? The person who commits adultery, if you say, well, look, give it up, you're not losing anything. <laughs> yes, I would be losing something. <laughs> uh, yeah? What about, um, I guess some, some things are considered sins in some religions and not others, like alcohol is considered a sin in Islam, but not in Judaism. And so you'd be missing out on, on alcohol. Um, versus, <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, I was talking to one of our graduate students yesterday who has applied for a job at a Christian college where if you join the faculty, you have to sign an agreement that you will never drink alcohol again. And you're saying, ooh, <laughs> you know, can I actually sign that pledge or not? I mean, if he's not the kind of person who's going to sign it and cheat, but it's like, that's, that's a non-trivial cost of going to that college. Um, I have other friends that teach at Brigham Young, and it's the same sort of thing. It's like, don't tell me I'm not losing anything by joining the faculty at Brigham Young University. Uh, yes? So people, they devote a lot of their lives to their religion, and like, people who like, study That's a great point. It's not just whatever pleasures might go along with sins of various types that you would give up if you led a life of faith. It's also you'd be spending a lot of time, presumably, on this, or at least you might well. So that's time you could be spending on something else. So consider the person who spends, I don't know, several hours every Sunday morning in church. They could be doing other things with that time, right? So even if it's a small cost, you might say it's some cost. They wake up in the morning and they actually have to like, go and do this. And if they're wasting their time, they're wasting their time. As a Pokemon Go player, I don't feel the power of that objection tremendously, <laughs> but nevertheless, no, that, that was supposed to be funny. Nobody thinks that's funny. I mean, I, don't, I waste my time in all sorts of ways, so it's like, that's the least of my worries. But still, you might think, hey, I have a lot to do, right? I'm a busy person, and I could be doing something else valuable at that time. Yeah? If you're a nun, you don't get to experience having a family. Oh. Be a big reward. Okay, if you're a priest or a nun, you don't get to enjoy having a family, and there are all sorts of things that are negative about that. Yeah? Yeah, if it's a, like, not just like Christian religion, but like, say you're like a Scientologist, you can get sucked away from your family, your friends, your money. Like, Ooh. like if it's just faith for the sake of faith, it can be. Right. Okay, good point. I mean, religions could do, involve various degrees of commitment, and so there can be a cost in <laughs> terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of all sorts of things, really. Human relationships, other things, yeah. I'm just going to object to that and say I'm no expert on Scientology, but I don't think that they believe in much about heaven or hell. Like, I thought they believe in more sort of reincarnation. So would they even... This. Now that's an interesting point too. This assumes a certain religious conception of what happens after death. And not every religion actually thinks that, right? If you have a religion that's based on the idea of, of reincarnation, or actually in Buddhism, um, it's a question of the escape from the cycle of birth and death. Heaven would not be conceived of as something that's like eternal bliss. It would rather be escape from existence. And that's a different notion. That's more like the just blank. You finally are done. You're finally out of this. And so so you're right. This little chart, even if it was this simple, would look like a different chart in different religions. It would be a different game from the point of view of a Buddhist than it would be for a Christian, I'd say. Anyway, there are many objections that we can raise here. Uh, not only the more rose objection and the question of whether these things are filled in correctly, but there's also the objection of the columns. Uh, maybe we should take into account different possible gods. After all, it's not just sort of God or no God. What if it really is a question of, ah, the Holy Trinity, as opposed to uh, Yahweh, as opposed to Allah, as opposed to Krishna, as opposed to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We might have this complicated view of what possible gods there are. That would be kind of like that question of different religions. This argument also assumes that God's existence has a non-zero probability. Because after all, if there's just no possibility that God exists at all, that is to say if the concept, for example, 
is really incoherent. It's unintelligible and incomprehensible because it makes no sense. Then it would turn out that, well, that first row is just a sham, in which case it's not clear that any of this quite makes sense, or at least that's an objection that's often offered. Now, is that a good objection? Suppose somebody says, wait a minute, I don't think it's even possible that that left-hand column obtains. I don't think it's conceivable <laughs> that there is a god. Would the argument fail then? Yeah? Wouldn't you just default back to this idea that we don't know, we can never know whether or not it exists, or we can never know if it's Oh, well, if we knew that the left hand column couldn't happen for some reason, we'd still have this question of whether you're better off. So it's, we wouldn't quite have to go back to just saying, well, now all bets are off. <laughs> I mean, we might conclude that, and that's what this objection assumes. At that, that point, we just have no way of talking about this question at all. But it does seem to me Pascal's answer would be, well, no, we're just on the right-hand column then. So it's like, do you lead a better life if you have this, in this case, false belief that there is a god or not? Um, that brings out, actually, that this argument is not anything like an argument for the existence of god. It's really potentially, I think, compatible with the thought that God doesn't exist, but you're better off believing he does anyway. Um, religious people, let's say, but actually, there is real psychological research on this. Religious people tend to be happier. They have better relationships. Their marriages are more likely to succeed, and so on. And so you might look at that and say, gosh, I'm better off believing, even if it's all nonsense. <laughs> yeah? But if, again, bear with me. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, if you were doing that too, wouldn't it be like kind of a false hope, like as opposed to somebody who genuinely believed in the happiness or that, instead of somebody that's like just try, trying to look for that through religion? Yeah. Or, so. Well, right. It would be very strange to say, yeah, okay, you've convinced me the whole concept of God is incoherent. But the psychologists have also convinced me that if I become a Mormon, for example, I'll lead a longer and better life. So I'll be a Mormon, even though I think the whole concept of God is nonsense. <laughs> It's like, wait, what? Right? How, what state of mind is it that would make you inclined to that? So, so yeah, I think you're right to say the kind of Pascal could say, look, even if it turns out that the left hand column is impossible, um, the argument still could work. But you're right, you couldn't think of it that way, or else that would undermine the whole point. You can't very well say, I will believe that God exists, even though I think it's impossible. <laughs> You know, that would be saying, I believe that God exists, and I believe that God's existence is impossible. And that's a bizarre state of mind. Yeah? You can stake your virtues in something else other than servitude for God. I mean, you can live like a good, happy life and like treat people well and, you know, you know follow what are essentially the Ten Commandments or, you know, whatever, without yeah. servitude to a God. Well, right. And so that's a way of saying that actually the God virtue is just independent of this. That's something that you might get in other ways, and maybe even religious people get it in other ways. Right. Yeah. Uh, going back to like multiple columns. Yes. I thought it was interesting if you think about an evil deceiver sort of God, where if you believe it, you go to hell, but if you don't believe it, you go to hell. <laughs> Ooh, the evil deceiver gods! Like, believe in me and go to hell. <laughs> uh, but don't believe in me and, aha, why? So. That's, it. That's interesting, right? If we had a really perverse God <laughs> who rewarded you for you know, not believing in him. Anyway, I'll just conclude with this. Pascal says, in the end, none of this is really a question of reason. In the end, he says, all reason reduces itself to a question of feeling. That is, in the end, he says, what really drives people to belief is not this argument. It's just emotional. It is just a question of feeling. So, one of his most famous quote, quotes is this. The heart has its reasons. Reason does not know. Okay? We feel it in a thousand things. In the end, people believe or don't believe on the basis of emotion, on the basis of a feeling. And the heart has its reasons. So religion is in the end a matter of the heart. It's a question of appealing to the heart, speaking to the heart, not so much to the head. Okay? The heart experiences God and not the reason. This then is faith. God felt by the heart not by reason. So in the end, his view is that faith isn't really a matter of belief or something else cognitive at all. It's something that is felt. It is a sort of emotional thing. It's a matter of the heart. And so he says heart, instinct, principles, 
That is really where things buy. The primary thing is in the heart. That leads you to have certain instinctive reactions. That then leads you to adopt certain rational principles. But the heart is commanding the head and not the other way around.